Well, I really enjoyed that message from Greg. Thank you, Greg. Um, you can tell he knew Daryl Mefford. He could get it across the plate, couldn't he? I would go through that buffet again. Okay, that was good. That's a lot of work. And it was done well. I really appreciated that. That was encouraging. We've got a Florida Grace Conference coming up in January, and there are flyers out there on the table. If you'd like to have one, they're out there. You can get one. There's some information here that you could use to come and visit us in the sunny state of Florida in the wintertime. Now, how many times do you get an invitation to leave here when it's snowing up to here? Yeah, well, we want you to come. It would be good, and uh, we'd like to have you. You're all welcome. And uh, it's a great thing to get together and have some fellowship uh, and some of those things because uh, that's what we should be doing as members of the body of Christ, is fellowshipping together. And uh, the name of our church back home is Suncoast Bible Fellowship, and that's because we're a whole bunch of people in the same ship going the same way. That's what we are. And we enjoy that, and uh, we enjoy uh, having conferences and going to conferences, so it's good to be here. We appreciate that. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. <clears throat> and let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your word, and we thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for all of us that we would have eternal life as a gift, and it being the gift of righteousness, we thank you for it. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Okay, God's forever nation. Uh, the title is actually the forever nation, but it is God's forever nation, is it not? It's his. And, uh, you know, the, the issue with uh, some of these things come up when you get to Romans 9, 10, 11 is um, kind of like when you get to the end of the book of Acts. You get to the end of the book of Acts and you say, what happened? Where's Peter? Where's the 12? Uh, who's Paul? Now, by that time, you know who Paul is. But you're still faced with this monumental problem of why the sudden ending to the book of Acts. Well, the answer to that is Romans 1.1. 1, 1. And as you start to move through Romans, you realize that this is, this is a serious issue because... God's great gospel manifesto contains the blueprint that causes and allows us to get eternal life. It all happens and culminates in 10 verses, Romans 3, 21 to 31. But when you go through the book of Romans, there is, there is a, a little section in it here that we've been studying already, and it's, it's about the past, present, and future of the nation of Israel. And as you know by the chart, you all know time passed but now and ages to come, that God likes us to think that way. He designed that for us. And uh, one of the great things about that is that you can actually get a better sense of what is going on in the life of the nation of Israel. And Paul is privileged to give us this information so that it can help our edification. In the book of uh, Romans, over in chapter 9, um, when Matt was talking about this a while ago, he hit one of my favorite verses, was Matthew, or, uh, Romans 9, 23 and 24, and he talks about that. And when I first, I really got a hold of this one day when I was reading it, and I really enjoyed it. In verse 23, and he says, And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. And then verse 24 he starts the next verse with even us. And of course, when you realize that's us, then you, you begin to get excited because he says, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Paul gives you a little glimmer of the idea of the body of Christ right there. And then if you go over to chapter 12, turn over to Romans chapter 12, you see a little bit more distinct bit of information about it, Romans chapter 12, verse 4, as we have, uh, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. So there's a little bit more about the church, the body of Christ. And so while he doesn't develop it 
uh, he does mention it, and he starts to talk to us. Uh, I've always said that the, the, Romans 9, 10, 11 taught me something very important about who I am. And it happened by teaching me who I'm not. And once I learned that, 9, 10, 11 got to be a little easier. And there are some difficult things in here to, to, to look at, but when you break them down and you study through these things, it's not that hard. It's interesting to see how Paul takes a break and he's just going to do this right now. He, he comes right off of Romans 8. And if you take Romans 8 and Romans 12, they link right together, don't they? It doesn't break the context. It, matter of fact, it, 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 what it does is it begins to lend clarification and it gives us some understanding and it gives us great assurance about Israel and their coming to a final fruition. And that restoration and that glorification in the kingdom of heaven is going to be one big deal. And it's a big thing and it's going to be there and it's going to happen and here we see how it's going to do that. Because God isn't through with Israel yet. And some people, you know, they'll try to find fault with some of these things and they were talking about the Calvinists a while ago and then, the, you know, the covenant guys and all these people, they, they don't understand how to read their Bibles and study them. And that's the big problem. Paul says in 11 verse 1, he says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. Well, if you go over to chapter 11 verse 15, he says he's not going to cast them away, but then he says in verse 15, for if the casting away uh, of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Well, say, he, he did cast them away. So which one is it? Did he not cast them away or did he cast them away? He did not cast them away permanently. Permanently. He did not cast away his people permanently. But there is a temporary casting away that's taking place right now. And it happens to be, oh, let's see, like 1980 some odd years old. Now, Israel has a a tendency to be a little tendency to be a little stubborn. They're stiff-necked. And they blew it when they came out of Egypt. The kingdom of heaven was ready for them to set up right then. And they they balked at Kadesh Barnea. And then about 14 or 1500 years later, they do the exact same thing on the day of Pentecost in the year of extension. Well, how many strikes do you think they're going to get? Well, they're going to hit the last one. But there's only going to be a wee little bit of them doing that because two-thirds of them are going to go down the wrong place. And one-third of them are going to come through the fire, and that, well, I tell you, that's going to be something. And God has not cast away permanently the nation of Israel. He cannot do it. And when you make these three chapters to be something that they're not, and you begin to make yourself or your denominational system out to be a spiritual Israel, and you're a spiritual Jew, then you are spiritually blind, and you have no business talking about the Word of God. <laughs> How do you read it? You're blind as a bat. You're blinder than Bar-Jesus, okay? I like Mr. O'Hare when he says that was a dispensational parable, and it's true. It is. He, he, he's walking around, and, and the whole thing is, it's beautiful the way it's laid out. The Lord Jesus Christ wants his nation and will have his nation in the land. There's only seven years on the prophetic calendar to get that done. And it's going to be one wild show. And we're going to be watching the whole thing. Amen, yeah, from a, from a nice advantage point. <laughs> Anybody that wants to get me in the trip, I'm sorry, I'm not interested. He says, I say then, hath God cast away his people, God forbid. And, and the reason that he says it this way, he has an answer. He says, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Well, he didn't get cast away. 
What would have happened if Israel had been cast away permanently? Well, the whole thing would have crumbled. There's no truth to it. And then you end up making God a liar if you say that. The whole thing rests on the entire prophetic program. You can't bust the scriptures. It's not possible. But you do have to pay attention when you're reading them. Because there are some things going on sometimes that, 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 that you might you know, miss because it takes a few times reading something to really absorb it. The Word of God is wonderful that way, isn't it? For God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. Now the fact that he foreknew them in verse 2 demonstrates that there was no possible way it's ever going to happen other than how he says it's going to happen. Because he looked forward and foreknew it. When you get into the future, if you go out into the future, there's no problem there. I had a kid at the camp, where they, we write questions out, the kids write questions out, and we try to answer some of their questions. He says, has the future already happened? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you go out into the future, we're getting ready to send you there, by the way. You know, if, you, if, you, if you go out into the future, you don't have to worry about that. God's already been there. You know? He's there all the time. He doesn't, he doesn't necessarily have to think in past, present, and future. But I thank God that he, he allows us to do that because it really keeps us from being trying to do three, three things at one time, okay? Just focus on today, okay? Just, it's today's sufficient for itself, you know? Don't, don't worry about yesterday and tomorrow. Now, you can plan like you're going to be here 100 years, but, you know, you need to live like he's coming back, like, right now. Amen. And keep it close like that. Don't, don't spend all your time worrying, Okay, God hath cast, not cast away his people for he, that he foreknew, which he foreknew. Wot ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel. <laughs> he was mad. You know, he's man, that, that Jezebel's chasing me, and I, I'm, I don't want to lose my head. And I can see old Elijah running around from Jezebel. And he finally gets away, and he says, this, this ain't going to work, you know, and he starts crying out again. He's, he's putting this stuff out against Israel, and there was some information that he did not have that he really needed, and that had to do with God's answer, okay? He says, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. And that witch is after me. She's trying to kill me. And the answer in verse 4 is, but what saith the answer of God unto him? You know, he kind of thought he was the only guy left on the planet. And yet, he was not. Remember, Moses made the same exact problem. He, he made the same exact mistake. He runs away at 40 years old out to the far side of the desert, and he hangs out there until he's 80 years old, and I guess he's looking forward to retirement. He doesn't really seem to care much about Judaism because uh, it hadn't been, you know, started yet, but as far as leading the Jews and doing all that, that he, he really didn't know what was going on, and he goes out there, and he's, he's so busy and, and doing whatever he's doing that he just, he just kind of wastes those years. And when God gets him at 80 years old, that's when he puts him into the ministry. It's fantastic how he, he goes and he deals with Moses. And Moses, once again, he, he just didn't understand. But what saith the answer of God unto Elijah? He says, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Now, I can see him listening to that going, well, where are they? Well, they're in reserve. You don't need them. You're fine. It's tender how he takes Elijah and deals with him after that episode. And he very gently uh, kind of just takes him on into the retirement phase of his life. He's going to train Elisha, and he's going to get some of these other things accomplished. But he's going to kind of just, uh, you know, it's over. Elisha was a wonderful prophet, and he had worked hard to preach the Word of God. And we find out that the assurance that God is going to keep the nation of Israel on track, and you say, well, they've been off track from the time of Moses. 
where they reject the, the whole program back there. Then they go about 13, 1400 years, and then they balk again in the day of Pentecost in the year of extension. And what happens is there's been another 2,000 years. That's almost 3,500 years of wasted time. But that's only about three and a half days with God, so it's all part of his plan, isn't it? But we have assurance because there's a remnant. Now, the body of Christ is not a remnant. There's nothing about us that's a remnant. We're a completely new creature. And the remnant here, he says, even so, in verse 5, he says, even so then at this present time, which would indicate the time where Paul is writing this, he says, also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Now, what does he mean by that? What does he mean by the election of grace? If there is a remnant that is according to the election of grace, then how did they come, how did they come into being the remnant? How did they come into getting saved? Do you think Christendom's confused on that? Most, most all, almost all of the, the more radical denominational systems, they, they all seem to think that the way you get saved is by works. Now, if you could get saved by works, then you wouldn't need a savior. Now, this has been going on now for 4,000 years, all the way up to the Lord Jesus Christ, and now the cross has been... Uh, the, the cross work is done, the price has been paid, and they still want it to be by works. You know, all that time under the law, they could not keep it. And they proved it over and over and over and over. And now, today, as Christianity has somewhat morphed into churchianity, there's a problem because they think the same thing. Now, I'm not saying everybody does, but I'm saying that it's getting pretty close to everybody because I don't, I don't talk to too many people that, that, that teach what I teach about the gospel. I really don't. I went to two funerals in the last couple of months, family funerals, one of them was about a 5,000, 6,000 seat auditorium, had four or five preachers, and not one of those guys got up and gave the gospel of grace of God to all the family members that were there, and there were a lot of people there. And I went to the next one, and it was in a small church where the lady who, uh, uh, that passed away was, she was a real right divider. She understood right division, and she taught it for many, many years. Her, her husband used to be on the Grace Mission Board, and they, they, they're up from this area right here. And that, that funeral was totally different. Now, the pastor that did it, he didn't give the gospel. <laughs> but he did talk about how much she did. <laughs> and in the process of doing that, I said, okay, they got it at least. You know, when you get people in a room, folks, and you get a microphone, you better give the gospel. That's the, that's the whole idea. You know, Paul says, he, he quotes David, and he says, I have believed, therefore I speak. <laughs> we also have believed, and therefore what? Speak. Ambassadors, speak. And if you don't know anything else, just learn the gospel and go do that, because we need a lot of that too. We need people getting saved, okay? Th this is just... It's, it's not that difficult. The, uh, the rejection part of all this, as, as you go through it, you see this stumbling. So Israel's program is temporarily suspended. In, a, in an overview, you see in chapter 9 that Israel, that's their past history of unbelief. And then in chapter 10, you kind of see their present problem with unbelief. And then in chapter 11, you see how that they're going to be restored. Now, that's kind of basically how it's laid out, but the details are very interesting. In light of all that, in chapters 9 and 10, you, you want to kind of consider what Paul's saying in chapter 11 because he's talking about some, some very interesting things. 
And he goes on, he says uh, here, he says, even so then at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. The election of grace has to do with how those people in the remnant got saved. And he's going to make a contrast for you. And he's going to show you that law and grace are mutually exclusive. If it's law, it's law. If it's grace, it's grace. You don't mix them. Now, I'm not saying that people that get saved by grace can't do good works. They should. Absolutely. We're not against that. In Israel's program, they did good works in order to get blessings and avoid cursings and have benefits. And, and, have, and, and so that was their goal. If you get a traffic ticket, like a speeding ticket or whatever, and you pay no attention to it, and then you get another one and another one and another one, and you get five or six of those things, and you don't do anything about it, and you get pulled over right when you're getting ready to go into uh, some fancy dinner or some wedding or something like that, right when you got to go in. The cop says, no, you're going with me. I gotta, I'm going to arrest you right now and take you downtown because you're not paying attention. Well, so you go down there and you pay it. You miss, your, you miss your outing. You pay it. And you say, oh, okay, I'm glad I got that over with. Israel, Israel had to pay. You know, that program, it, it is a program whereby they had to be under contract. And the most foolish thing they ever said on a national level was, all that thou hast said, we will do. And they say it twice in the book of Exodus. Well, if you do all these things, which is the big if, right? Well, they never did. They, they didn't realize that the first man ever born of a woman was a murderer. And they had his gene pool. They were part of that gene pool. And as you see them trying to do the, the impossible, you realize that not only do we live in the dispensation of grace, which I really am glad I was born in the dispensation of grace, aren't you? But there is also an opportunity for grace in a dispensation. As you, as you look, you, you see Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You see Abram, the same thing. He, I mean, he's justified by faith, isn't he? After he doesn't really do what God told him for quite a long time. There was kind of a long stretch there as he was making very bad decisions. Uh, these things all kept coming back to haunt him. <laughs> I think when he got saved, he, he started thinking differently. But... Job's the same way. They, they have the grace of God, and it's within a dispensation. It's not the dispensation of grace. Now, today, under grace, we're not under the law. So the law issue is done for us because Christ has paid that price. But under the new covenant, there's going to be a new priesthood, and that new priesthood is going to be superior to Aaron and the Levites. The new covenant is based on the principle of what? Are we going to repeat that and say, law? No, because there's no point in it. It's already been proven. 1,500 years is enough of it. And he proved that by the works of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. That's it. Case closed. So the new covenant and the spirit of it you see beginning with the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ and then on the night before he's Crucified, he ratifies it, and, and he's talking about the shedding of this blood. This is done all in the, in the, on the premise that the new covenant is not going to be like the old covenant. That's what makes it old. It's, it's no good anymore for anything other than... Now, I'm not going to say that there's no law in the millennial kingdom. I'm just saying that they don't need judges and juries and lawyers to solve it. It's all in one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, you only get a semblance of justice if you go to court. You only get an opportunity for justice if you go to court. You don't, you're not guaranteed justice. Under 
the ministry of God in the kingdom, you will always get justice. You know, sometimes you, you got to be careful what you ask for. You say, I just want a fair deal from God. No, you don't. You do not want a fair deal from God. You want God's grace and his mercy. You know, and there is a little difference. In the Old Testament, mercy is when you didn't get what you deserved. That's, you show, throw yourself on the mercy of the court and you say, please have mercy on me. You don't get what you deserve. But in the dispensation of grace, when, when you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for your sins, you will not have to die in your sins. And instantly you will be put into the body of Christ, and then you don't have to ask for anything. You know, you don't have to stand around doing this. You know, come on, give it to me. No, you don't have to do that. What you do is you get it all at one time. So there you don't get what you deserve, but now you get what you don't deserve. But you don't just get a little bit of it. You get it all, all of it. People said, you know, this guy said to me, he's going to cut the pie up. We're going to all get a piece. I said, no, we're all going to get the pie. Every one of us get our own pie. We don't have to cut it up. It's all in Christ. And when you get put into Christ, it's, it's all in you now. And so this whole idea of the remnant gives us assurance that God knows what he's doing and it's going to happen. So don't worry about it. But don't try to steal it and make God a liar and make yourself a spiritual Jew. Because blindness in part has happened unto Israel until the uh, fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So if you're a spiritual Jew today, you're, you're, you're just, you're blind as a bat. Don't try to be something you're not. Because you'll end up being wise in your own conceits. And that's not good. Y you see, verse 7 says this, What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for. Well, what were they seeking? They were trying to do something the wrong way. Brother Greg said it a while ago beautifully several times. They were trying to get something by paying for it. And when you pay somebody, okay, or you, turn over to Romans 4. This is a good illustration. We'll just use it. Romans chapter 4. In Romans chapter 4, Paul's going to show you about, he's going to show you two men that get saved, and they get justified, one of them before the law and one under the law. And he says here in Romans 4, 1, what shall we say then? Uh, that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory. He did some pretty courageous things. He whipped a whole army with 300 and some odd servants. That's pretty good, you know. He comes back with all these things. He, he, he meets Melchizedek, offers him a tithe, okay. And he proves right there that the, the priesthood, the Melchizedek priesthood, is superior to the Aaronic priesthood, which was still in him, hadn't been born yet. And he bows and gives him that 10%. And what happens is he gives it to who? The high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Well, the, the kingdom program can't operate on a corrupt Aaronic priesthood. It has to have a new priest and a new order. Who is that? The Lord Jesus Christ. He's after the order of Melchizedek. And so you see the, 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 the whole idea of that blessing is going to the who? The lesser guy or the better guy? It's going to the better guy. It goes up. And so Abraham did a lot of great things. He says, for if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. Well, if he, if he can't glory before God, then who are you going to glory before? You and people. Right? He says, for what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God. And it, his faith, his belief in what God had said was counted unto him for righteousness. 
Now, here's the principle. He says in verse 4, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace. So if you work all week, do you, do you get your paycheck with a bow around it and say, Oh, we got a nice little gift for you this week. You grab that thing and say, Hey, that's not a gift. That's mine. You owe me that. I gave you the sweat. Now you give me the cash. That's how it works. You owe me. And until he pays you, he's a debtor to you. When you try to work for eternal life, you make God the debtor. He says, now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, he says, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now that happened in Israel's Bible while they had it. They could read that verse, those verses right there about Abraham. Read the whole story. The whole book of Genesis was there. You'd think they'd have figured that out, wouldn't you? But they didn't. They were too busy making up other books and following after other gods and doing other things. So he says, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the who? The ungodly. That's the premise of what the cross does. It saves the ungodly. If you're godly, you don't need a savior. Paul says in, in 1 Timothy 1, he says, the law is not made for a righteous man. Why would you need it? But it is pertinent and, and it is true that the law is necessary for culture and for community and for civilization. Why? Because every one of them cute little buggers that comes out of the hospital has got a sin nature. I raised three of them. I know. I got a real kick out of uh, Ray's little joke about him and Decker <laughs> last night. I wasn't, I wasn't expecting that. It kind of hit me by surprise, and then I go, yeah, that's the way Ray's jokes go. They, they kind of get you like that. <laughs> and that was pretty funny. And then, and then Greg had a good one today, too. You know, it's, it's always nice to uh, inject a little humor into the message, because we talk about such serious things, don't we? But when we talk about it, we can talk about it with confidence. Because in my mind, I am in Christ. And I'm saved. And I'm already there as far as I'm concerned. I don't have to worry about getting there. So I can speak freely of these things by experience. And I enjoy doing that. I told the young man at camp, I, I talked to this young boy, He's brand new, and I said, uh, well, let me know, let me know right now, are you saved? And he started looking around, you know, how they do. And he says, um, I said, what's the, what's the deal? Are you saved or are you not saved? He says, well, I have a security problem. <laughs> what? <laughs> you have a security problem? I said, what's the problem? And he, didn't, he couldn't answer. He, did, he just looked at me and I said, I'll tell you the problem. I said, you might be lost. Have you ever thought about that? It never hurts to turn the heat up a little bit. All week I was on him, okay? Not too bad. I didn't bother him, but I, I did make him sign a contract, you know. <laughs> I gave him one of my crunch question seats. I said, now you, you tell me how you got saved. You don't give the gospel to people. You make them tell you the gospel. Let them give you the gospel. Well, kids are good about that. They'll write it down. In the little class I was teaching, one of the little classes, I had a whole uh, group of kids around the table, and I gave them all one of those crunch question slips, and every one of them came back right except for him, the one with the security problem. <laughs> and so we began to talk, and by the end of the week, I says, how's your security problem going? And he says, pretty good. He's, I said, well, are you saved? Do you know for sure that you have eternal life? He goes, yeah, I do. You know, getting your assurance is a big deal. It's like getting saved all over again, isn't it? Because people who don't have assurance, uh, they, they, they live in doubt all the time. So when you're in doubt about whether it's by works or whether it's by grace, Go to Romans chapter 4, because Romans chapter 4 is going to confirm what Romans chapter 3 has just taught you. There are some laws concerning this too, by the way. Turn over to Romans chapter 3. The law is this.
We'll start in verse 24. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Why would anybody have to forbear? Why would God have to forbear those people in time past if they weren't sinning? It was through the forbearance. Yeah, it was through that forbearance system that they were able to get saved. And if a Gentile wanted to get saved, all he had to do was proselyte into the program. The problem is, when you're proselyting into a program of works, you're in big trouble. He says in verse 26, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just. Could he do it any other way? No. He says, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Now, here's the question, verse 27. Where is boasting then? I like the next one. It's three words. It is excluded. And then he tells you by what law. He says, by what law is it excluded? Is it the law of works that it's excluded? Negatory, okay? It's not he says, it is but by the law of faith. And that's the issue here in chapter 3. That's the culmination of everything Paul has been writing about for three chapters. In 15 verses in chapter 1, you've got 43 indictments against humanity. And that just happens to be the Gentile humanity, the ones that he gave up. You get over into the latter part of chapter 3, you get 14 more indictments against humanity. Uh, the whole world. And if you go into chapter 2, uh, I don't know how many indictments there are in there. I didn't count them, but the, the, the concept there is, well, Israel should have known better. What did they do? They asked the most ridiculous, impertinent question you could ever possibly ask at the end of chapter 2. And the question is this. Verse 29 of chapter 2 of Romans. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, he says, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not of the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. Circumcision is not just the outward thing. It's, it's what happens here. And then look at the question. What advantage then hath the Jew? What a dumb question that is. Because the answer is so simple. He says, or what profit is there of circumcision? He says, much every way, because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. They should have known better. They should have known better for 1,500 years. They should have known better before they tripped and stumbled and, and were blinded all over again, which is where we are now. Turn back to Romans 11. What's happened to them during this period? Somebody asked me recently about, can a... Jew be saved today in this dispensation of grace. And I said, there is no such thing as a Jew in the dispensation of grace. I asked my dad when I was young, we were studying the Bible, and I said, Dad, what's a, what's a Gentile? <laughs> I didn't know what it was. And he said, it's anybody who's not a Jew. I said, what's a Jew? These words were not familiar to me, you know, and, and as I began to study a little bit with him, I began to learn, oh, there's two groups of people in the Bible, Jew and Gentile. Yeah, that's great. It's not that hard to get. 9, 10, 11 really lay it out pretty beautifully, don't they? Those, these three chapters are great. So go back with me to chapter 11, and when Paul talks about this remnant whose election is according to grace, they, they seeketh for, you know, in verse 7, he says, but what then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for. What were they seeking? They were seeking justification by faith. They were seeking what Abraham had already said, or what Moses had already recorded about Abraham. They were seeking eternal life. Did Abraham get eternal life when he was justified? You better believe he did. What's the proof of that? 
He believed in resurrection. He believed it so much that he said, yeah, well, Lad and I will be back here shortly. We don't have to worry about what we're doing. So same way with Job. While they were in Egypt, Job is saying, I believe. He says, I know that my Redeemer liveth. Wow, that's a pretty secure thing to say, isn't it? See, if you go all the way back in the beginning and you see how Abel was saved, you see where the rift was between him and Cain. That was the argument. That was it. And God was so gracious with Cain that he, he gave him a very long time, and he never came around. But he did give him a long time. They, they are seeking not the kingdom. They're not seeking any of that. They're seeking on how to get saved. What then Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for? They weren't, they weren't, they weren't uh, receiving it, and they weren't obtaining it because the leadership of Israel was corrupt. They were law keepers. They were do-gooders. They were unrighteous men, and they were a major stumbling block to all of those in Israel. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ had to go up into Galilee to get his apostles because everybody down in that area where Jerusalem was, corrupt. John the Baptist shows up with uh, camel's hair, wearing camel hair coat. Well, is he dressed like a Pharisee or a Sadducee or a priest or whatever? No. He's completely out in the wilderness doing something so he stays away from that mess. And when they come up, what does he do? Oh, he chews them up. I mean, he tells them. Yeah, and they just want to come down and make a, they want to make a great show in the flesh so they can get some political capital. That's all they were looking for. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Who are the rest? That's Israel. That's unbelieving Israel. They had bad advice. Have you ever heard of the, like today, kids are getting bad advice from their teachers in college? Paul had that problem. Gamaliel was, he was a dumb bunny, okay? He tells the nation of Israel, just leave it alone, it'll go away. Just don't worry about them. Just leave them alone, they'll go away. What should he have been telling them? It's true. They are who they say they are. Who were they? They were the provisional government of the kingdom of heaven. Right there. And they had one year. That's all they were allowed. And that year of extension was burning through. And they've already lost John the Baptist, and now they're going to lose Stephen. Okay? When you see this, you see a group of people that are so hell-bent on going to hell, they don't, they're blind. And they are blind today. But that doesn't keep an individual Jew from getting saved. This is a national issue in 9, 10, 11. He says, they did not get it. Look over at Romans chapter 9. In verse 30, he says, what shall we say then? that the Gentiles which followed after, not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel which followed after the law of righteousness hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Wherefore? He says, because they sought it not by faith. He says, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone as it is written. Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. You remember what he told uh, after m missing a whole week of being with the Lord? Uh, he goes in with the apostles, and he takes that apostle, and he takes his hand, and he puts it in his side, and he feels that wound. And he drops down to the ground, and he, he lets it out, you know. And he makes a pronouncement on him, a blessing about those who believe without seeing. 
and you see Israel is blind. They cannot see. Go back to uh, chapter 11. He says in verse 8, According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. They don't see the kingdom being set up today. They don't see them being the head of the nations. They don't see them having their land. Look at what they're trying to hold over there. Man, it's sad. They don't see anything and have not seen anything relating to their kingdom in almost 2,000 years. A man was telling me here recently about some uh, stuff he was reading about the Holocaust, and he said there were, there were Jews that were getting saved in the concentration camps from Christian people that were in there. There's Lutherans and Jews in there. And some of those Lutherans were in there, and they were other Protestant uh, denominations. Hitler went after the Protestant preachers first. First thing he did was get rid of those guys. Then the Lutherans, I mean, th that group as well. And then he goes after the Jews. Well, they're in the concentration camp, and they're dying. And many of them were getting saved. And these testimonies are being written about. And I'm just like, wow, that's great. Kind of late. But better late than never, right? And David said, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back all way. How far down? All the way. <laughs> they're down as low as they can go, and they're going to get lower before it's over. It's going to be a real problem for the nation of Israel. But God has a remnant, and he's going to seal 12,000 young male Jewish virgins from every tribe. He knows the human genome because he designed it. And they're going, to, they're going to be men who have never been with a woman. They're going to be men who are going to be sanctified. And they have to get saved like everybody else. And they, they are sealed for that purpose. And they're going to go forth. Can you imagine 144,000 Pauls going out? Oh, man, that would be great, wouldn't it? I'm going to be, I think it's going to be fun to just watch all that. Because it's going to be the program resumed. And it's not going to be this big, giant failure that everybody thinks it is. The scoffers. Where's your kingdom? Where's your kingdom? Where's your kingdom? No, it's not going to be that anymore. It's going to be seven years of a romp. And the second half is going to be so strong and so hard and so loud and so crazy that they'll, there won't be too many people left to explain it. I had a young man was trying to tell me that the horses in the book of the Revelation were all like uh, mechanical things. Like, you know, the tanks, you know, and you know, all that stuff. I said, no, there won't be any satellites. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff, okay? <laughs> There's, it's all going to get down to a really small group of people on the planet, okay? It's going to happen so fast and so hard that God says there's never been a time like it and there never will be in the future. It's, it's going to be terrible. But it's going to be wonderful for the nation of Israel because they're going to look upon him whom they have pierced and they're going to weep and they're going to mourn as one weepeth for his firstborn. And they're going to say, what are those wounds in your hand and that wound in your side? What? And he says, well, those are, I got those in the house of my friends. <laughs> Some friends. Well, no, in that day, they'll all be his friend. And they'll all be living with him, all around him. And it's going to be one of the most exciting times. It will be the most exciting time in human history. It was the reason the earth was made. And so we thank God that while we don't have to worry about going through the tribulation, we do have people around us that might. And so the best thing to do is get as many people on the boat as we can, right? Get as many people into the body of Christ as we can. Because no matter how much you don't want to go do that or don't like that person or whatever it is that's keeping you from doing it, it's not worth it.
for them to go to hell. You shouldn't wish that on anybody. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the blessings that we have in him as members of the church, the body of Christ, and we thank you that that we can come together as members of the body of Christ and fellowship in all of these things and study these things and talk about them and encourage one another. We thank you for these things today. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.